Uh, let me start by saying it is Pat Stocker who made me write the book. Because <laughs> she, she was on me all the time to write a book and actually introduced me to the person that helped me write uh, get the brokerage, um, what do you call, Helen, a... Uh, agent. Agent. So uh, Pat gets full credit for that, and uh, I am, will be forever grateful not only for Pat in that respect, but also for her friendship, her help uh, over the many years, and she contributed significantly to Marriott in more than a number of ways. Uh, you're very lucky to have her at University of Maryland. I was really excited today when I walked in the building because as I went through security, I was reminded that about a month and a half ago, I had to speak to 1,200 FBI associates. I knew they were all armed. I'm confident that you are not. So um, uh, I know you had to go through that security check, so I'm feeling very comfortable up here right now. The risk has been diminished significantly. Um, and had they been displeased, I would not have been here today. Uh, so I wanted to spend some time with you on a number of things. I have several Marriott veterans in the room and one competitor. I know where she is, so I, I will be very careful in that case. But uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on Marriott, for, but to tell you just... Marriott today is a very large hotel company. Uh, most of you are familiar. Many do not know that we are 18 different brands, including Ritz-Carlton, Bulgari, in our luxury collection. It is more of a brand company than ever before. Uh, we are close, I round up, I came from marketing and sales, so we're close <laughs> to 4,000 hotels, Actually, I think we're 3,752 on any given day, but we're moving in that direction. And so where Pat said we have 550 hotels internationally, I would generally say almost 600. So now you get kind of the flow of what I do when I start talking numbers to you. Um, we are global in 72 different countries, uh, and that has been the adventure that I'll touch on today. Uh, as we moved into these 72 different environments. Today we have about 179 hotels internationally under construction in a number of markets, which Bill Marriott's very excited about. He's trying to get us to 80 countries before he retires someday. <laughs> and so he's very anxious every time we touch a new country or put a new flag in the lobby. The company itself uh, is labor intensive because our industry is labor intensive and outside the United States today we believe and are very proud of the fact we've created about 80,000 jobs and whenever you look at an emerging country that is where the biggest pride point is is because we're creating jobs and we're creating about 6,000 managers who will evolve and grow to become our leadership which is a principle that we really focus on. Now, I'm really excited about your title on challenges and leadership in a global environment. And I would love to sit here and we just kind of get around a circular table and talk for two or three hours about the topic, but I have been limited in time and uh, you are too. So I'm gonna try to touch on really three things in leadership that I think are important in a global environment. And one is decision making in this new world, and I'll come back to that. Another is relationships, which I can't help but keep using as a basis. And the third is culture. And when I talk about culture, I'm talking about company culture as much as the culture itself that you have to deal with in a global environment. I was really interested about some of the comments coming from our first speaker today, and you might find kind of hidden away in some of my statements, uh, some areas that I might not totally agree on. Uh, you did not pay me, so I can disagree. So <laughs> I am here to, to express opinions, but hopefully it will get a conversation going for your next portion of the meeting and agenda. Um, as we talk about decision-making and leadership today, uh, I did, attended a conference in Denver the other day talking to hotel deans. 
And I said, our biggest challenge today is to get leaders who can make decisions. Our market today in the area of business is that we need decision makers who are willing to make decisions. The culture, those of you who have studied the X and the Y generation, are often really focused on team decision making. And while I am a huge proponent of getting input and advice, somebody needs to go out and make a decision. And my, my ch uh, experience as a youth when I was in college, you know, you, you sat around and in my day you went to the coffee houses and you talked about what the implications were. If you had a great date and you saw the graduate, you could spend the whole evening talking about, you know, what was the real meaning. And, <laughs> and I worked as a security guard at the Prudential Center in Boston. And I had the outside patrol responsibilities. And one night I was confronted with three young men that uh, did not want to do what I wanted them to do, which was get off the escalator. And uh, so they kind of had me cornered. I was armed only with the nightstick at that point. We later added revolvers, but, uh, and I had a boss. Sergeant James probably had a sixth grade education, 20 years in the Army, got out as an E-5, so he had not progressed. He was about 6'2", very imposing individual, and uh, every other word was an expletive. So I will not use his sentence, but you've got to remember the military teaches us how to speak in certain language aspects. And um, I'm down there confronted with these three folks thinking about the amplifications of whether I should draw my stick, and I hear Sergeant James and he says, Fuller, blank, 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 do something, just do something. He didn't tell me what to do, but he wanted me to do something. So I picked the biggest guy, took out the rosewood nightstick, stuck it in the stomach, and the three of them ran away. Desired effect, it was a good decision. But he sat me down and said, look, you college kids are all alike. You spend too much time thinking too much time, and, and remember, we had expletives between each of these words. <laughs> and you need to sometime make a decision. Sergeant James rests on my shoulder every day of my life. Uh, he is with me. Sometimes I might say I have teams that have said, don't make the decision too fast. Make sure you get the input. That is the power of the team. But at some given point in the day and age, the business world we're in, businesses have to be prepared to make critical decisions, live with those decisions, and take on accountability and responsibility. Something we did early in our organization as we grew globally, because we had a distribution of offices overseas in a number of locations, and we had people who had taken on new roles. We had executive vice presidents around the world. They could not talk to us day in and day out and consult. We developed a program with a fellow named Rick Goldstein around accountability and responsibility. We defined who had the accountability for each decision and what decision had to come further. I was amazed at how relaxing that was to the people in the field because they actually knew what their accountability role was. And they had no problem making the decision because the risk had been removed. They knew where the accountabilities were, they knew where the decisions were, and more and more today it is essential to have clarity as to where decision making rests. In a global society, in a global environment, though communications is improving, you want to push the decision making down as far as you can, but you need to have clear lines as to who is the decision maker on these things, and then you've got to let them make a decision. And in our world, that is tremendously complex because in an individual country environment, your laws are different, your rules are different, and very much in decision-making today, 
it is imperative that you have the local understanding in place and not just rest on what your beliefs are. Now, Marriott is exceptional with including values in our company. Bill Marriott and the founder's values are extremely clear. We are not confused. We know what those values are. We know we're going to play by the book. We know we're going to wear the white hat. And we know we're not going to cross the line. That helps. Because as a company, if you have a clear set of values, your decision making becomes a lot easier. In a world that is global, fraught, fraught with opportunities for foreign corrupt practices issues that are US based, but that the UK has today even exceeded the US standard on, it is clear that it makes no sense to get involved in decision making that is going to bring risk to your company and the like. But at the same time, you have to find ways to work in these environments that are unique and that allow for those kinds of problems to occur. And that's where you have to seek other relationships and where relationships can come in and replace the problems you might face. Relationships, to me, are really the basis of global business. And I am afraid in this country we have lost this or are losing it. A friend of mine has a daughter, and he went down into the basement the other day, and there were the six young ladies sitting around, each of them tweeting and using their devices appropriately. My thumbs are too large to really do it effectively. And they were going back and forth, and he says, oh, who are you talking to? And they said, each other. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do a speech at Marriott, and I said, you know, I go down through the cubes, and I see everybody in there just, you know, going at it. I said, who, are you, who do they talk to? Each other next door. Yeah. I said, get up. Get out of the cube. Go see the person next door and ask the question face to face. But as a society in the United States, we are too prone to putting it on that tweet or Twitter or whatever, and we're not using our inherent skills to sit, communicate, and talk. Globally, that has not been an option. Relationships are everything, and relationships pay dividends. One example I'm not tremendously proud of where relationships have helped us is in a country which I won't list, and for Hilton's sake I will not describe too detailed, but we've had a long-standing relationship with this owner, and the owner has been someone that we've cultivated through many dinners, many attempts to help the family, know the family, work with the family, get the children into colleges in the U.S. when they needed help. None of these things come under the terms of bakshish or, or inigwanji or bribery. This is a relationship builder. And the obligation and the relationship gets deeper every step of the way. So when in this country one of our finance people failed miserably, and we would have been under any grounds to be thrown out of our facility there and tossed out because this individual failed, the relationship came into play. The individual showed up in my office, said, you know, this is not good. I'm really upset about it. But we have long-standing relationship. How can we work together to solve it together? If we had not had that relationship, they would have had every right to toss us out, sue us for some money, and make a profit. We make mistakes, we're humans. Business has mistakes in it. But relationships can pay dividends when you're in a corner. They pay dividends when you're expanding and want to go to other places because these folks will speak kindly of you because they take the business to heart. And in the international arena, 
more than anything else, it is imperative to understand what a relationship really is. I love in America, they walk up and sometimes when I'm doing class and I'm kind of pinned, well, I'm not pinned in here, I'd walk over to someone and I'd say, shake their hand and I'd say, in America, I now have a relationship with you. <sighs> That's not a relationship. And there are many meals, many discussions, many favors before you even can begin to have a relationship. And when you're in Asia, you're not even started because relationships require deep commitment of time and energy. But again, for us, it is paid dividends to invest that time and energy. Our Thai owners in particular, we've had wonderful solutions and some challenging situations in Thailand and expanded overnight to 30 hotels in Thailand that we never thought we'd see in that pace and time. But really, the selling was not done by us. It was done by our partners because they felt that they had a relationship to marry. Now, with relationships come implied responsibilities, and that's the problem that comes with a relationship. Because many times, you need to have a clear understanding of what that other person expects they have gotten from you. Case in point, in the Middle East, a gift is often comes with an implied responsibility. So Bill Marriott one day made a terrible mistake. One of our owners in Saudi Arabia is a prince. There are tons of princes. This prince was a favored prince, made a very important difference. Bill looked at his Ferrari because Mr. Marriott collects Ferraris and says, that's a great car. You got it. <laughs> Six weeks later, the car's in front of the corporate headquarters. Our lawyers are lying on the street going, oh, God, what are we going to do? How are we going to report this? We can't do this. Send it back. And we're going, no, you can't send it back. That isn't going to work. But we keep the car in New Hampshire. And every time the prince thinks he's coming to the United States, some poor guy has to drive it down to Washington so it's sitting in front of the building. The lawyers put it in the annual statement, and we fulfilled re obligations reporting to the government what had transpired. But let me tell you, the prince feels that Bill Marriott has an obligation to him. So understanding relationships is truly important, but it is the most valuable way to do business. And candidly, if we could re-implement this in the United States with the same strength, and if you could include it in your curriculum, it is essential that people start to use relationships. In my company, I spent most of my 40 years trying to use relationships in the building to get things done. And frankly, if you treat people fairly, openly, honestly, and spend time recognizing their accomplishments, it doesn't take much to have a relationship in the U.S. because they, they don't have the rules of the international arena. It is, to me, the best commodity you can have is a relationship society that really returns values. Now, I talked about the one uh, country. Let's spend a second on China. I was surprised that we did not spend more time on China. I've spent a lot of time in Africa, Latin America, emerging countries. Let me tell you right now, China is beating us, beating us badly. China knows in 14 years they have got a neutral domestic market because of the age, one child, they are not growing their domestic market at the same pace that uh, they have been in the past. So they need a global market. They have a strategy. I thought your question was good. I didn't get an answer to it earlier. They have a strategy. It's a very clear strategy. They are headed into every emerging market, whether they have resources or not. We have somebody here who's been to Ghana, and I'll touch on Ghana in that respect. The largest expat society in Ghana is 
China. They just built four government buildings for the Ghana government. They are planning on returns because as that country grows, they are there. When they build, they use what kind of labor? Chinese. They are putting their Chinese associates to work in other countries. So when you look at our African hotels right now, we're under construction in Rwanda, owned by Chinese, built by Chinese, designed by Chinese, Marriott name on top. When you go to our three projects in Kenya, the same thing will be said. Owned by Chinese, built by Chinese, Chinese name not on top yet. But that is going to happen too in our, our industry, but it's another 20 years away. You go to South Africa, our property there, Chinese construction, Chinese financing, Chinese ownership. You will find today in Algeria that the airport was built by the Chinese, all infrastructure roads were built by the Chinese, contributed but obviously traded for resources, left the Chinese labor in town. They have created a global empire. They're in the process of doing it. They're doing it through relationships. So when the time comes that somebody shows up with an American widget for sale and a Chinese widget for sale, who's going to buy what? They're going to buy the Chinese product. And this is moving at a tremendous pace in every emerging environment and it's moving fast, and they know what they're doing. It is a plan, it is a resource, and it moves ahead, and it speaks to a different kind of relationship, but it's a relationship. Last point I was going to touch on was culture, and then I'll try to take a couple of questions. Culture in a company today is something, and I spent time with the FBI Academy group on, that I think is not always totally understood. A competitor, CEO, once said to me, I don't know what competitor that was, but a competitor CEO said to me that one thing that Marriott had that was totally hard to re replicate was the culture. The culture started with our founder. The culture has continued through Bill Marriott's administration and the culture is the most powerful aspect of the company that motivates, drives, and forces. Every business, every company, every four-person company should have a culture. It should have values. It must have values. And when you have values, and if you teach that values can pay dividends also because your associates are committed. When you believe that, you can certainly see results. It's worth the time. And many cultures are what I call informal cultures that occur. Cultures that serve are cultures that are designed, developed, and implemented. I am a proponent that whether it's a police station in Florida or whether it's a university or whether it's a company or whether it's a small consulting group, you need to have those values understood top to bottom, believed in and adhered to, and it gives you a competitive edge. So I'll close with one story that I think makes this point and a couple of the Marriott people are tired of hearing this. This year we had the Arab Spring, uh, which was Cairo for me. Uh, we were in a meeting in January uh, over at one of our hotels on strategy. This thing broke out. I grabbed our chief operations officer. We climbed on a plane and headed for Cairo. And the fact of the matter is that uh, part of our job is to reinforce when we have a risk that Marriott cares about the people 
and I could bore you with the Tripoli story, but that's one we'll tell at a bar sometime if I see you. Uh, the fact is we have to tell our people overseas that they're just as important. They don't have to be American. They're just as important as anybody else. So during our trip there, we visited, we've got about 4,000 associates in Egypt. I probably shook hands with 1,500 of them. Our purpose was to reassure them, let them see the flag. Um, it wasn't that I was Ed Fuller, it was somebody came from corporate with a title that represented Bill Marriott, represented the company. We would listen and sit with our managers because our managers had stories, some that would bring tears to your eyes, what they were going through, what their families were going through. And we would also meet with our owners. Now, I will tell you that we got a benefit out of doing this. We renegotiated our contract for the Cairo Marriott while the riots were going on in the center of the city. We had only four more points on the contract, and I was afraid this contract was going to fall through, and it's our second most profitable hotel for Marriott. And we, could, we were in the process of trying to renegotiate a 15-year contract. And I was afraid if we didn't get this done, these guys over at the other company might just show up and try to take it away. But that was not the reason we were totally there. We were there for the associates. We got the contract. That's a $150 million contract, so it was worth the trip. But the real, real excitement was the story we heard in Cairo. And that was, yeah, I don't know how familiar you were with the situation. One evening, the Minister of Interior called off all the police. He was upset with Mubarak. He pulled off all the police off the street. When he pulled the police off the street, that removed anybody with a weapon from in front of our hotel because our security people are not allowed to carry weapons. We had people howling outside the gates because we had the media in the hotel. We had 500 rooms of media for which we felt very responsible. And of course, Anderson Cooper was sitting there going, I'm at an undisclosed location. He was at the Ramsey's Hilton, I know the decor. <laughs> and later all the CNN crew came over to the Marriott because it was, they felt it was safer. And uh, not wrong with the product, Ramsey's was just closer to the square. <laughs> and uh, so at this point, our security people were petrified. They didn't know how they were going to hold the gate. Our culinarians marched out of the hotel with their knives, stood at the three gates behind the security guards, followed by our housekeepers with brooms <laughs> and our engineers with shovels. They held those gates for four hours until the military showed up with tanks and infantry. This is culture at work. These folks are not paid to do this. Although I teased them unmercifully that we were going to charge their hours to the security department. The fact of the matter is they did this because they were feeling responsible for their hotel. They felt it was their role and they tell the story with unbelievable pride. And we have recognized them in a number of ways. So this is my argument for culture at work. It is also good money. It helps relationships. But if you have good values, and your people buy into the values, you've got great opportunity. Thank you.